what I'm going to try to do is give you a, uh, a summary, a preliminary synthesis of our results, which, which is basically a highlight of the information that the speakers are going to uh, present throughout the rest of the day. And we've got a list of the, the primary folk on this introductory slide. Throughout this talk, I'm going to have uh, the presentations uh, in this double panel format. On the uh, left-hand side, we'll have the variable, variable category uh, listed. And underneath, what I call the expectation. Uh, and expectation refers to the fact that if there was information from other studies that we anticipated the result that we got, uh, it would be anticipated if it gave us a result that we either didn't have from other studies or was novel, it was unanticipated. In a few cases, uh, we just had no information. Uh, it would say none there. On the right-hand side, we'll have a pictorial panel of the study result, or in some cases, basically uh, just a description of those results. And the sequence I will follow will be the same sequence as the speakers you'll see through the day. So the first variable is vegetation. We have two uh, vegetation variables that uh, I'm going to present here. The first one is buffer tree mortality. So in the right-hand panel, uh, the, the two panels are split into the riparian management zone panel on the left, RMZs, and the PIP panel on the right. And what we see is that mortality Buffer tree mortality generally increased regardless of where you, whether you were in the riparian management zone or in the PIP across the treatment gradient. In other words, with increase in treatment intensity, you had increased buffer tree mortality. The second vegetation variable is riparian stand condition, which was measured in context of uh, two different subvariables. Uh, live basal area and the change in live basal area. Live basal area is on top and change in live basal area is in the bottom. And the basal area or change in live basal area was basically the opposite pattern to mortality and it decreased as one might expect with increasing uh, treatment intensity. Our second variable category is wood. And within wood, uh, we had some subvariables. This one is new wood loading, uh, which represented the, the new wood, basically, that appeared uh, in each year of post-harvest. The first year post-harvest is in the, the top panel. And second year is below. And you can see uh, an increase in new wood in the first year post-harvest with treatment intensity. And then in the second year post-harvest, because treatment intensity has less and less of a buffer depending on the, the treatment, uh, you get the quadratic pattern. Both of these were expected. Second wood variable is, is uh, small and large wood in context of LWD large woody debris and small woody debris Top panel, oops, sorry about that. Top panel is large weighted debris. And in the case of large weighted debris, we saw no difference uh, between the treatments relative to the reference. In the case of small weighted debris, we saw an increase uh, across the, the treatment gradient. And this pattern basically was the same whether we considered wood in the large and small categories as a functional or not, functional being defined as wood that had some function within the stream system. Next variable is shade. Uh, and shade was measured in two different ways, uh, using HemiView uh, as the, the top panel is percent can canopy and topographic density. That's the HemiView measurement. And percent effective shade. Uh, using densiometer measurements. 
And what the panel show you is the pre and post condition for the two pre years versus the post years. And as you can see, you see you have a nice gradient basically across treatment intensity. The triangles are the most intense treatment, uh, the green triangles and the, the green dot, I'm sorry, the black dots are the un, unharvested references. Next variable is water temperature. And uh, water temperature is the first of variables that uh, is, was discharge linked. So you don't see a reference on the x-axis on these because the, all the variables that were discharged linked basically already are adjusted for the reference. And on this display, you have uh, the two post years being uh, graphed. The solid dots are the first year post harvest. The open dots are the second year post harvest. And what you see is uh, a treatment gradient with increasing treatment intensity, but a real difference in the 0% buffer treatment. Uh, the other thing that is notable here is that if you look at the second year for the forest practices and the 0% buffer, it looks like you have incipient recovery in the temperature pattern. Next variable is discharge or flow. And discharge was measured in, or discharge was compared in context of mean values. So the, the values shown here are variations around the mean. And in general, discharge increased in all treatments. But the one thing that we want to point out about discharge is the, the mean comparison is, may not be the way to uh, understand the, the, the best way to understand variation, and it may conceal important differences resulting from extreme events. Next variable, or set of variables, is exports, which included uh, suspended sediment. And one of the striking things in this study is that suspended sediment uh, was very responsive to discharge. In this graphic, um, the suspended sediment response is in red with the red dots, and the flow is basically the blue line. Most of the turbidity values, which was how suspended sediment was evaluated, were extremely low. Um, the, the vast majority, over 90 percent, and we found no evidence of a post-harvest increase in suspended sediment. Next aspect of exports is nutrients, and nutrients were measured in one of two ways. So nitrogen was examined, phosphorus was examined. Nitrogen is nitrate, phosphorus as total phosphorus. Nitrogen is on top here, and nitrogen increased basically with treatment intensity relative to the references. Whereas phosphorus increased across all treatments, but it was not significantly different across those treatments. One of the things that you have to remember about this study is because it was on hard rock substrates, um, it was pre-designed basically to potentially not have a great sediment effect. But we wanted to measure sediment in a coarse way to understand if that was really the case. And that was done in one of three ways. It was done using the WORSEM model uh, to estimate the sediment for roads across the, the units. It was also estimated from uh, wind throw as the result of root pit delivery of sediment into uh, wind throw, at the base of wind thrown trees and as a result of uh, bank erosions that were significant. None of those three sources showed uh, a major changes in sediment uh, during the post-harvest period. And what the graphic is showing you here is the atom annual sediment delivery using the Warsum model. Um, and as you can see across the years in different colors for most of 
the treatments, there was very little difference in that estimate among treatments. Next set of variables is channel characteristics. Um, and we have sort of two categories of things under channel characteristics. The first is, is stream dimensions. And the stream dimensions are sh I'm showing are not all the ones that, that were measured, but we got a very similar pattern across several different things. The top one is the change in percent rise by steps. The bottom is the change in stream wetted width. And in both cases, we got a significant difference in the 0% treatment from the balance. The, uh, the next variable is litter fall. And litter fall was, was measured uh, in a terrestrial situation as the total change in litter, litter, litter fall is the log of ash free dry weight. Uh, again, uh, we have a decreasing gradient across the treatments. And whether we looked at coniferous or deciduous litter fall, we had basically identical patterns. All the variables I've shown you so far had basically anticipated patterns. Um, some of the next set of variables I'm going to show you had unanticipated patterns, and uh, some of them were uh, quite peculiar, and uh, we don't necessarily have a good interpretation for all of them yet. The first of these is uh, detritus, and total detritus basically was sort of the equivalent of uh, litter and detrital complexes in stream. And measured as the log of ash-free dry weight, we got no significant differences in total detritus across the different treatments. Paraphyton. Paraphyton was our sort of pseudo measure of production. Um, not exactly primary production, but somewhat close to it. There were two measures that were incorporated at, oops, ash-free dry weight on top and chlorophyll A on the bottom two panels. And the left-hand panels are the response from early summer. The right-hand panel is the response in late summer. And the significant result across paraphyton is that there were no significant differences in um, across the treatments and references uh, for the, the treatment by period interaction term, which is the important term that we were looking at in this study. <coughs> Next is macroinvertebrates. The top panel shows total macroinvertebrate numbers uh, in numbers per day. Uh, where we saw no significant difference across total macroinvertebrates. Uh, and this pattern was actually true for all the other groups except two. Uh, one was that predators differed only in the 0% treatment. And the second group is the one that is shown down below, which is collector-gatherers. And collector-gatherers showed a uniform response across all treatments relative to the reference, but was not different between those treatments. Um, one more thing. Uh, the, all the responses here uh, were anticipated, with the exception of the functional group uh, scrapers. Um, and I'll come back to why that's a, an issue in a little bit. Next set of variables is amphibians. And amphibians were looked at in two different ways. In context of simple occupancy, in other words, were they present before in the pre-harvest period relative to the post-harvest period? And what you're seeing here is an entire matrix of all the sites down the left-hand side with our four uh, amphibian categories, 
uh, larval tail frog, post metamorphic tail frog, torrent salamanders, the three species considered together, and giant salamanders, which were also considered, even though they're not technically a forest and fish target species. And the immediate result that you get when you see this matrix is that there was very little change pre and post harvest in context of occupancy. Um, this is a rather dramatic difference from the original predictions made in Oregon where uh, one anticipated potential disappearance of some of the in-stream breeding amphibians uh, originally hypothesized by uh, Bruce Burry and colleagues. We had three sites um, two for tail frog, where we did get a change in the occupancy pattern pre and post, but that pattern was in opposite directions in those two sites, and one site with torrent salamanders where they changed from being present to not being detected post harvest. Second amphibian category is abundance, um, and we got some rather interesting patterns. Uh, with abundance. Uh, with tailed frog, we got a quadratic response where the forest practices buffer had the highest positive response uh, relative to the other experimental groups of units. Tail frog post metamorphs also gave us an unanticipated response where we got a significant uh, increase relative to the other experimental units. Um, torrent salamanders showed no significant difference, uh, even though there was somewhat of a, a drop in the means in the forest practices in 0% buffer. And giant salamanders gave us the most peculiar response, uh, which got a, a decrease in abundance in the forest practices buffer relative to the other treatments. Um, all these were unanticipated with the exception of tailed frog larvae. Um, as you're probably aware, tailed frog larvae are grazers, and we fully expected with the increase in light, we would get some kind of a, a positive response from tailed frog larvae. The fish analyses uh, differed a little bit. One of the problems with the, the, the fish analysis is even though we looked at fish in all 20 basins originally. Uh, 14 of those 20 basins did not qualify for the fish study because of issues, as Amy already mentioned, with the length of the, the fish unit before we had a tributary coming in. So we couldn't separate the compounds of the fish response in that basin with potentially an adjacent basin. So we had six basins that became sort of a series of case studies, as you'll see later. The fish in these basins relative to larger headwater streams were, had lower densities, smaller average sizes, and slower growth. And Jason Walter will give you the details on that. The last category is trophic pathways. And the trophic pathway variables were done to gain an understanding of whether we would see a shift in the, the trophic web pre and post harvest, but we saw very few differences. And the only differences pre to post observed were in the N isotope ratios for the collector gatherer invertebrates and in the, car uh, the carbon isotope ratios for small giant salamanders. Those changes don't seem to be linked to the, the trophic structure uh, support of streams insofar as we measured it because there were no changes in either the carbon or nitrogen ratios either for paraphyte or detritus which are the two basal elements uh, for the food chain structure uh, in these systems at least the ones that we measured. Um, I want to mention however that the forest practices response was the sole treatment in which any amphibians, in this case giant salamanders, exhibited a negative numerical post-treatment response. So the fact that we have things happening in both the uh, stable isotope ratios and with uh, a numerical response in giant salamanders 
may indicate that we have something happening in forest the forest practices treatment that we don't understand at this point. The results do agree with parafitin. Remember, parafitin had no difference across the treatments despite the reduction in shade and canopy cover. They also agree with the lack of response in scrapers, which we expected an increase in had we had an increase in parafitin. So in summary, we had changes in vegetation, its derivatives, physical stream characteristics, stream morphology, and most of the macroinvertebrates, and all those changes were anticipated. We had a set of changes in detritus paraphyton, the macroinvertebrate uh, scraper group, or lack of change, selected amphibians, and trophic pathways that were unanticipated. The lack of change in detritus paraphyton, scraper macroinvertebrate, and most trophic pathways seem to have some kind of explanatory nexus. The few changes among amphibians require more complex explanation, some aspects of which are, remain unclear. And that's one of the things we're, we're working on right now. So if you have uh, a couple general questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, save your specific questions for the speakers that are coming. Thank you. <laughs>